you ever considered what a sidewalk, a street corner, a tiny park, or even a bus stop can do for you? Well, today I'd like to share with you a series of experiments that try to save the planet one tiny public space at a time. Why has this become important today? With all that scientists know about the environmental crisis today, including all the new technologies and all of the improvements to our existing technologies, the rate of environmental damage is still increasing across the planet. So for example, the technology in our cars is getting more and more fuel efficient, yet our fuel consumption keeps increasing rather than decreasing. This is paradoxical, but it's not new. More than 150 years ago, this man, William Stanley Jevons, discovered that gains in energy efficiency ultimately lead to gains in energy consumption. So you would expect that the wider you build our highways, the less we have traffic, but it's the exact opposite. The wider we build our highways, the more we experience traffic congestion. And the exact same thing is happening with the way we use energy in our homes. Since 1990 in Canada, energy efficiency improved by 45% in the residential sector. Yet, energy consumption increased by 7%. Technology is doing amazing work. Yet our energy consumption goes up. This is a very strange paradox that points to very counterproductive behaviors. So technology cannot be the only way we go ahead and solve our environmental crisis. Our behaviors are one of the many factors in our environmental problems. You may ask, why do we feel so passive? We see this all the time. We're bombarded on a daily basis with all this information about the catastrophic effects of climate change, yet how many of us in here know what a kilogram of CO2 is or does? And does that kind of information help change our individual actions? Like taking the bus instead of the car or taking the stairs instead of the elevator? So, if these expert messages are alien to us, if they don't inspire us, what is all around us and has the power to influence our behavior individually and collectively, directly and every single day? That's our public spaces. How could we draw upon the power of even the most banal of our public spaces in our cities to be able to mobilize collective environmental actions? Okay, what does that mean? So let's imagine for a moment that we're walking in our own neighborhoods and that we're able to encounter these crazy installations reminding us of what we can do on a daily basis to better protect our environment. This is not a fantasy. I'm going to present you two examples before I talk about my initiative that either raise awareness with public spaces or directly engage citizens. And the reason why I chose these two examples is because they show the different kinds of, of ways we can use public spaces. Awareness is all about knowing and, and making people know about a topic, but engagement is doing. So we'll start with the first example, which is an example in Amsterdam. There was a, you know, everybody likes Amsterdam, but even Amsterdam has some unsafe areas. So the community got together and they decided to make one of these unsafe areas safer by using lighting, but they didn't want to inc introduce heavy infrastructure, they wanted an environmental solution. And so they worked with scholars and professionals for, to design this kinetic stick that collects energy through human activity. And when you hook it on the tree, the entire la area lights up making this once unsafe or marginalized space into a beautiful and even welcoming area. And this was done by people just walking and running together on a daily basis. So it impacted an entire community and was good for the environment and their health. So let's go to another example. This was in Paris 2015. This was also an example that used public space but this time to raise awareness, the other example. 
but in the, they, used, they used public space in this case in a rather shocking way, and I'll explain. This was one of the very important events on climate change, the UN Climate Change Conference in 2015. Um, so there was tons of experts there, all kinds of experts there, and yet the most moving experience there was not all the talk of climate change and all the data that was being exchanged. The most moving event there was rather these chunks of ice cubes. The artist, Oliver Eliasson, used real chunks of melting Greenland glaciers. These 12 pieces, as you see, arranged in a circle like a clock, a reminder that time is of the essence. Does anybody see any frightening data here? No. Just chunks of ice sitting right in front of the Pantheon. People watched this ice melt. This was a very powerful experience. These chunks of ice represented one-tenth of the ice that melts in a Greenland summer, but not per summer, not per month, not even per day, per second. So this event touched thousands of people, causing an international dialogue on the melting ice caps in Greenland. This was a powerful experience, yet we were just witnesses watching this ice melt. Where do we go from there, apart from feeling really worried about our future? So we have seen two examples here so far, both using public spaces, but in very different ways. On the one hand, we have one that raises awareness, the ice watch, and on the second, we have one that is directly engaging its citizens. <coughs> So the difference is that awareness is a first step and a very necessary condition for engagement, but engagement is what gets things done. We all know we need to exercise, right? That's awareness. But actually exercising, that's engagement. And this is exactly what our team at Concordia University aimed to accomplish and improve regarding climate change issues. So we have two goals one based on awareness and one based on engagement. Awareness for us is all about moving the conversation of climate change out of the university, which it sometimes has a tendency to stay locked in, and moving it right into the community so that we can share that kind of information to everybody in the community. That's number one. That's awareness, and that's a first step. Our second step is engagement, and how do we want to do this? We want to be able to awaken in some way environmental behavior in all of us so that we are empowered to act more environmentally. So you may be wondering, how do we do this? So we've, we've devised three principles of which we set aside for ourselves to be able to achieve these two goals, awareness and engagement. First, the citizens are our enablers. What that means is every single installation that we work on, because we also work on public space installations, like our two previous examples, Every single one of them is directly related to a community priority. So we work with the community, we understand the priorities, and our public space installations are focused on that. Second, public spaces for us are key because they are the points of junction between academic knowledge and community action. So this is the point of interaction where everything happens for us. And third, Design challenges are our method to generate tons of unconventional and crazy ideas. And the reason why they're interesting for us is because we can mobilize people from all over the world, especially with, you know, with um, social media. It's very easy. And this is what we've been doing with our design challenges. Because our initiative is based on the island of Montreal, and because we want to, to, this to be a long-term project where we use public space installations as a way to communicate to, com to our communities different issues about climate change, we wanted to use the longest urban corridor possible in the city of Montreal as our organizing principle for all of our public space installations. And so we've selected Sherbrooke Street because it's 31 kilometers, it runs east and west. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to build an urban narrative of a kind of environmental awakening, an environmental awakening path. This is our, our idea. 
And our goal is to really exhibit 31 kilometers, which is Sherbrooke Street, of concrete and stimulating ways to mobilize environmental actions. So you walk along Sherbrooke Street and you're able to see different kinds of installations depending on the community and, and the installations, like I said before, are directly related to community priorities. Just to give you an example of some of the uh, uh, design challenges that we have organized. This is our, th these are some images from our last one. Just in our last design challenge, what we did is we called for ideas that would inspire citizens to use the bus all year round. And that's kind of tough in Montreal because we have very extreme weathers. By using the small space surrounding the bus stop itself, that space that nobody ever looks at that is always ignored. We all hate taking the bus, right? Mostly because we wait and wait and wait and do nothing, right? But what if these tiny neglected spaces that are everywhere in the city and that nobody ever looks at could help us and inspire us to change in some way while we wait for the bus? We received about 100 ideas from more than 20 countries, 25 of them only from China. And so I'll just give you an idea of some of the ideas that we, that we received. Some of them adopted the, the subject in a very playful manner. Some of them were quite interactive in the way that they wanted people to come and use the bus, because that was the goal. Others were informative about different uh, questions about climate change and different consumption patterns in a very, very direct way while others were informative and playful at the same time. We received many, many different ideas. So our initiative is really at the intersection between knowledge and action, where each one of our design challenges, like you saw before, is all about rethinking the power of even the most banal of our public spaces. And more importantly, is a way for us to relearn what public spaces were always meant to be, which are places of dialogue and places of change. So just take a moment now that you're in your own neighborhood and that you can imagine that in one of the street corners, there's an herb garden, and another one of the street corners, there's a children's shoots and ladders game that teaches you environmental actions, et cetera, et cetera. These types of things are easy. These types of things can be done by people like you, by us, by you. You can initiate, you can be the one that plants the seed, you can be the one that paints the floor with the games, and then have your community and your neighbors come and join in. So let's take back our planet and save our planet one public space at a time. Thank you.